Today is a special day for a special person in my life. But sadly, that person is not able to be with us today. Uh, it's my father. Many of you know my father, Merlin. And uh, he hasn't been uh, doing so well this week. And so unfortunately, he had to stay home today. He's um, had some real challenges with his breathing and um, is on oxygen. And uh, so he is home and not with us today. But today is my father's 84th birthday. And if I know uh, my dad and my mom, they are watching us today uh, via our video streaming. And so uh, happy birthday, Dad. And I um, just want to wish you the best on your 84th birthday. And by the way, I want to say this about our video streaming. Uh, hopefully within the next few weeks, uh, we are going to be boosting our bandwidth here uh, through some things that we are doing. And it will allow our video stream uh, to go out with even greater strength than it has. Uh, there are a number of people that are watching uh, our worship services uh, every Sabbath and, um, they, they, and being impacted by that. And so for that, we can say thank you and God, God bless and, uh, this ministry and um, certainly for those who are shut in and not able to come to church, uh, it's a real blessing. As we launch into our teaching today, let's do so by asking God's blessing on his word. Lord, I would ask today that you would anoint your word once again, that you would anoint my lips, our ears. For the past several weeks, we have been exploring a sermon series that is on the life of Elisha whose name literally means, my God is salvation. And we have been discovering through the life events of Elisha the prophet that every encounter that he has is a testimony to the fact that God is a God of salvation. We're nearing the end of our series. In fact, there's only two more after, after today, two more stories in the life of Elisha. But today we are going to focus once again on the fact, the truth, that Elisha's name means my God is salvation. And it was not only an appeal to the people of his time, but an appeal to us. And so I invite you to open your Bible today. We're going to be taking a look at a story that is not one of the uh, probably not one of the better known stories of the life of Elisha, uh, but an important one nonetheless. So would you open the scriptures to 2 Kings chapter 8, and we're going to begin with verse 7. We're going to take a look at eight verses here. 2 Kings chapter 8, beginning with verse 7. And as I said, it's, it's not a, a real common story. It's not like the stories you read of Elisha and the woman of Shunem and raising her son to life. It's not like the story of Elisha uh, cleansing uh, Naaman of leprosy. It's not like the story of Elisha and the city of Dothan. And, and uh, it's not like the story of, of the floating axe head. It's kind of an obscure story, but an important one. And let's take a look at 2 Kings chapter 8, beginning with verse 7. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Then Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Haziel, Take a present into your hand, and go to meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? Now, this is really interesting. This is really interesting that Elisha is going to the city of Damascus that he would be near Ben-Hadad. If you recall in the stories that we've taken a look at thus far in the life of Elisha, you can see that he hasn't had a real tremendous relationship with Ben-Hadad. We're going to unpack a little bit more of that later, though. So here is Elisha in the city of Damascus, in the country of Syria, 
Ben-Hadad finds out about it. He sends a message through his trusted servant, Haziel, who was a high-ranking officer in his court. Verse 9, so Haziel went to meet him, that is Elisha, and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camel loads. Can you imagine that? 40 camel loads. I have no idea what he took, but it says every good thing of Damascus. He took to Elisha. And he came and stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. Isn't it interesting that he refers to Ben-Hadad as your son, as he's communicating with Elijah. Your son, Ben-Hadad of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from the disease? No doubt, no doubt, Ben-Hadad had done some reflecting in his situation and this illness that he had, and, and he was kind of scared. You know, am I gonna am I gonna die? Am I gonna live? Well, what's gonna happen? What's my future hold? And he hears that Elisha the prophet is in town. And suddenly he has a flood of memories. Ah, Naaman went to see Elisha. And Naaman came back whole. And no doubt he had heard other stories about the ministry of Elisha. And of course, his own army had been taken captive uh, through the work of of. Uh, Elisha, you remember when they came to the city of Dothan? Pastor Jan spoke on that about a month ago. When Elisha, they came after Elisha in the city of Dothan, and God blinded the Syrian army, and 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 uh, uh, Elisha was able to lead them to Samaria, the capital, and King Joram took them all captive, but then fed them and let them go. You know, all of these things are coming to his mind, I'm sure, and he's thinking, wow, you know, maybe God has a miracle for me too. Shall I recover from this disease, he asks. And Elisha said to him, Go, say to, to him, You shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Whoa, wait a second. That kind of seems like a contradiction. Go and say to him that he will recover, but the Lord has really shown me that he's going to die. Okay, what's going on with Elisha here? Is, is Elisha being deceptive? Is, is Elisha, you know, resorted to telling lies? Verse 11. Then he set his countenance, that is, Elisha did, set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed and the man of God wept. Now that kind of seems to be a little bit ambiguous here. But basically what was going on is Elisha the prophet was kind of in a stare down with Haziel. And it's like he's looking deep within Haziel's life. And God is showing Elisha something about Haziel. And it so moves Elisha that he breaks down and starts weeping. Verse 12, and Haziel said, why is my Lord weeping? He answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire and their young men you will kill with the sword. And you will dash their children and rip open the, their uh, women with child. So Haziel says, but what is your servant, a dog, that he should do this gross thing? And Elisha answered, the Lord has shown me that you will become king over Syria. Interesting. Then he departed from Elisha and came to his master who said to him, what did Elisha say to you? And he said, he told me you would surely recover. Verse 15, but it happened on the next day that he, that is Haziel, took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it over his face, that is the face of Ben-Hadad, so that he died and Haziel reigned in his place. End of story. Wow. A, a rather interesting story. And, 
you know, I've read this story over and over again and kind of scratched my head and said, okay, you know, hey, what's going on here? Well, what's, what's this thing all about? There are some questions that, that bear asking about this story. Number one, did you ever wonder why Elisha went to Damascus in the first place? I mean, why of all places did Elisha go to Damascus? After all, wasn't he the prophet to Israel? And for Israel? Why on earth would he go to these heathen dogs of Damascus, of Syria? A question worth asking as we consider this story. And question number two, was Elisha telling a lie about Ben-Hadad's recovery? Was he somehow being deceptive to Hazel? We need to clear that up because, you know, we certainly wouldn't want to think that Elisha, a prophet of God, was involved in deception. What's going on in this story? Some important things as we consider. And, and I've invited Pastor Jan to come and join me. And her and I are going to kind of dialogue and kind of banter back and forth about what some of the uh, things are that are happening here in this story and maybe some of their implications uh, for us today. So, you know, as we consider this story, Pastor Jan, um, what do you think of that first question? You know, why did Elisha go to Damascus? I mean, wasn't he supposed to be the prophet to Israel and for Israel? Why would he go to these heathen dogs of Syria? That's a good question. Um, but I, I think of Elijah um, before he calls Elisha, he is told in um, 1 Kings 19.15, and I find this interesting. He says, Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. So even Elijah's ministry, God is showing that his prophets are just more than prophets for his own people. So wait a minute, you're telling me that even years before this event happened, Haziel was anointed to be king over Syria? Yes. Hmm, okay. So, you know, I find it interesting, and I, I believe that God is on this mission to reach everyone. So, so why? Let me, yeah, and that's a good question. Why is it that God is telling his prophet, an Israelite, Elijah, and subsequently Elisha, to go and do something of this nature to another nation? I mean, weren't they supposed to be focused on Israel after all? And, and again, you know, that's the purpose of God is for the, the children of Israel to be lights to the nations around them. And his purposes for us are to be lights in our community. And, you know, it's not, you know, we as the church are not an exclusive club. Okay, so wait a second. Let's go back to this whole thing about Elisha. Um, so Elisha goes to Damascus because somehow God is trying to teach his people that they have a mission beyond themselves. When, when he originally established Israel as a nation, when he called and laid that burden on Abraham to be the father of this great nation, it wasn't so that they could become some exclusive club. It wasn't so they could just be self-serving. It was so that they could take the truth about God to the other nations who had not yet accepted him. Is that not correct? Correct. And so is it possible then that Elisha was trying to demonstrate that to the people of Israel that God had not given up on his efforts to use them to be salt and light to the rest of the world. Absolutely. I mean, you think, you think just in the stories of Elijah and Elisha, Elijah is sent to the widow in Sidon. You know, the, the ministry, you know, God protects Elijah in the enemy's territory. 
And, you know, God has these opportunities for them to, to reach. I mean, the story we had of, of um, you know, the whole army gets taken to the king of Samaria, you know, and throw a feast. And Naaman gets healed. You know, none of the lepers in Israel get healed, but Naaman the Syrian gets healed. I mean, God has has all of these witnesses. That little that little girl that witnessed to God's power, even the though she of even though she was taken captive and taken so, from her family. So there seems to be a motif running throughout these stories of Elisha that God is attempting to use His people to communicate the complete truth about him to the surrounding nations, something that they had lost sight of. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you know, one thing that I find rather interesting in this story is Ben-Hadad, when he actually, in verse 8 of 2 Kings chapter 8, he says, it says, And the king said to Haziel, Go to meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord. And the Lord there is, that word Lord is actually the word Yahweh. So Ben-Hadad actually acknowledges Yahweh God. And, uh, and, and it's interesting how all of this kind of begins to happen. Now, let's, let's go and take a look at a second question. Um, was Elisha telling a lie to Ben-Hadad when, uh, when he told him, you know, through Haziel that he would surely recover and he indeed did not? What was going on? What, what do you think was happening there? Well, for one thing in the Hebrew, there's a negative in there. So um, it's, it's unclear, and some of the other manuscripts, you know, ha in the Hebrew manuscripts have, have a little notation that says certainly he will recover. They don't put in the negative. But I believe that what Elisha is saying is that you, this sickness is not leading to death. You know, you could recover from the sickness. However, you know, God knew what was in Haziel's heart. So God knew the nefarious actions that Haziel would take. And while Ben-Hadad had a sickness that would not lead to death, God in his infinite wisdom or insight insight, his his uh, his uh, omniscience knew that Haziel was going to murder Ben-Hadad. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. So that maybe explains why and gives us a, a, a better understanding of the fact that, that Elisha wasn't telling a lie. He was indeed telling the truth. He would recover. But it was only through the nefarious actions of Haziel that Ben-Hadad lost his life. So Let's take a look at how this story impacts us. Let's, let's draw the practical ap applications of what this story says. I mean, we've taken a look at the what. Now let's take a look at the so what. And something that you kind of referred to it here a second ago, and I want to come back to it in depth, and that is this. It seems that this story, that the main point of this story is that God wants his people to reach out to the world with the complete truth about him. Would you not say that that's the case? He wants his people to reach out to the world with the complete truth about him. I believe he wants us to be salt and light. And he was wanting Israel to move beyond uh, the exclusiveness that they had developed. In fact, it's interesting to discover what happened because of their failure to do that. What happened when Messiah came? I mean, they were so bent on the fact that, that they had this exclusive club you had even the disciples of Jesus that were turning their nose up at people like the woman at the well of Samaria and other people who were uh, the Syrophoenician woman and other people that they considered to be heathen dogs. Well, even within their own race, they had their own, their own set of standards of who was, who, who was to receive God's mercy and who was not. You know, the, certainly publicans and sinners. You know. And then you come to the book of Acts where uh, a Peter, God through a, a vision, comes to Peter and, and shows him that he needs to go to this Roman centurion with the full gospel. And, and God, in fact, sends this Roman centurion, sends people from his household, from the centurion's household, to come and get Peter, 
to go and give them the full gospel. The Bible is replete with these kinds of stories that God is wanting His people to move beyond a mentality of some exclusive club to take on an understanding that He has given them a message to tell to the world. And I believe that this story that we read here in 2 Kings chapter 8 echoes that sentiment of God that He is calling His people not to become some exclusive club, not to be self-serving, not to be navel-gazers, but to, but to take the complete gospel, the complete good news about God to a world who so desperately hears that. And you know what? Uh, that's clearly outlined in the book of Revelation. It's something that we all know that as Adventist Christians we've read before and we know, but it's something that's a good reminder to us. Would you take a look at Romans? Cha uh, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. We pride ourselves on an understanding or at least a belief and say we believe in the three angels' messages. And what is the first angel's message? It says, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That means... That the good news about God needs to go to a heathen dog king like Ben-Hadad. That means that the good news about God needs to go to someone like Naaman, even to Haziel, to other people. The good news about God needs to go to the entire world. To Nineveh. To That's Nineveh. Our Sabbath school lesson. Yes. <laughs> Ben-Hadad was a heathen king, but God was attempting to reach his heart. And we see exactly Examples, other examples of that in Scripture. How long? Forty years, it seems, that God worked on the heart of Nebuchadnezzar before he surrendered. This heathen dog king of Babylon. And yet God reaches him. God softened Ben-Hadad's heart through the healing of Naaman. And when Ben-Hadad gets sick, he asks Elisha to inquire of Yahweh about what his future holds. Go. You think about it. I mean, it's pretty powerful. Ben-Hadad, he's seen Naaman healed of leprosy. He's, he's seen that, um, you know, that, that God tells Elisha where he's going to be and what traps he's going to set up. And, you know, his whole army ends up in, in Samaria. I mean, he sees the power of God. And, and I can't but think that, you know, his heart is softened as he sees God at work. And he sees the power of God through the prophet Elisha. Yeah. Especially when he comes to the point that he's actually acknowledging that there is a God other than the gods that he goes and worships in his own temple. Yahweh, and he even refers to him. Go inquire of Elisha and see what Yahweh has in store for me, if he has a miracle for my life. And so, it's interesting, through these events, I believe that, and through the ministry of Elisha the prophet, God was attempting to communicate to Israel and beyond, my God is salvation. My God is salvation. His very name, Elisha's very name, revealed, my God is salvation. And it was a message that not just Israel needed to hear, but the entire world needed to hear. And friends, my God of sal is salvation is a message that each one of us here needs to embrace in our lives personally. The truth that my God is salvation is not something that we simply should embrace, but as we embrace it, it's a message that we should take to our community of Simi Valley. Can I hear an Amen. It's a, it's, a, it's a message that we should share with our friends and with our family. It's a message that needs to go, as the book of Revelation says, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It's the everlasting good news. My God is salvation. How is God going to accomplish that? This last week... Tuesday evening, Pastor Jan and I had a very interesting 
event happened. Some of you heard it. Some Those of you who uh, were at See Me House of Prayer this last Wednesday evening uh, heard the story. And in fact, uh, when I shared the story Wednesday evening at House of Prayer, uh, I didn't now, I walked away from there learning some additional things to the story, as you'll hear. I'm going to share this uh, now. We're going to share this story with uh, the rest of you who were not here. And so, uh, Pastor Jan, Tuesday night, we were in the church office. It was late. It was probably about 9.15, and we were in the office. You were in your office. I was in mine. What happened? I, I was just working on a computer, um, you know, sending a, uh, a message, an email, and I heard this voice say, um, <clears throat> hello, is anybody here? Hello. And I said, hello, I'm here. You know, and as I get up to go meet this person, this person says, um, I, I'm a doctor at Los Robles, and my phone was in the parking lot a half hour ago, and it was in the seventh space. At this point in time, I'm hearing this conversation. I'm in my office, and I'm saying, what on earth is going on here? So I walked out and I introduced myself to this gentleman and told him that I was the pastor of the church and uh, what could we do to help him? And at that point in time, he then says, well, listen, he says, um, I'm a surgeon over at Los Robles Hospital. And he says, um, my iPhone came up missing. And he said, I went online to uh, iPhones have a way that you can find where they're at online if they are lost or stolen. And he says, I went online to find uh, my iPhone. And he says, I traced it down to your, to the Seventh-day Adventist church parking lot. And he says, it showed me the exact space in the parking lot that it was in. And he says, I, I, I came here tonight. And he says, um, the only cars in the parking lot are yours. You know, it was just, by that time, Pastor Jan and I were the only ones that were still there in, in the in the." Uh, church office in the parking lot. There was nobody else there. And so we, we, had had, we had had a little meeting. Um, there was just a few people in our meeting, but we'd also had the I-9 group who were renting the gym. So I called Ann up to find out who was the um, leader for the I-9 and to give them a call and see if they knew of who, who this person might be that might have his phone. And so I was doing that, busy with that, and then you got the brilliant idea. I talked to the doctor, and I said, well, you got on your computer, and you traced the phone here. How long ago was that? And he says, well, he says, that was about 30 minutes ago. He says, because I live in Westlake Village. He says, I got in my car right away, and he says, I drove all the way over here. And he said... Um, so that was about 30 minutes ago that I traced it to your lot. And I said, so we have no idea of knowing where it's at now. But I said, wait a minute. I said, we could get on the computer now since it's not here and we could try to find out where it's at. And he said, great. He says, I've got my laptop out in the car. So we came in, we got him on the, on the uh, Wi-Fi in the office and he pulls it up and we're working to try to find the location of this phone and we found it. It was on its way to Moore Park. His phone was on the way to Moore Park. In fact, it was going down L.A. Avenue in Moore Park. But he couldn't zoom in on it. Uh, and then it stopped. Yeah, it stopped, but he couldn't zoom in on it enough to tell exactly where it was at. And he's thinking, what's going on? And he says, man, he says, I don't know what I'm going to do to find my phone. And he tried calling it. We tried calling it from the office there, and no one answered the phone. And so... Anyway, and, and, and as we're doing this, I'm thinking, uh, not these exact words, but the idea, my God, is salvation. Why don't we pray? And so I, I said to, to the doc, I said, you know, why don't we just right now pray that you will get your phone back? See, we had no idea whether this doctor was a believer in, in God or not, but we offered to pray with him, and he said, please do. And so... Uh, Pastor Jan and I uh, surrounded him, and, and we began to pray and, and ask God for some divine intervention here. And, and we prayed two things. Um, Pastor Jan prayed that he would find his phone, and I prayed that if his phone was taken um, intentionally and it was stolen intentionally, that whoever had it would have conviction to return it or something would happen there that he would be able to get his phone back. Uh, 
the doctor thanked us so much. He says, you know, he says, I rely on my phone. He says, it's amazing. He says, as a surgeon, he says, I have to maintain contact and, and uh, with the hospital. And he says, I never know when I might be called. And he says, I've got a patient right now that's kind of, you know, in the balances. And, and I could be called to the hospital any, any moment. And, you know, I could tell he was really worried about it. And I told him, I says, well, Doc, I says, we'll continue to pray about it. And I says, you know, I don't know how this is going to turn out. But I said, here's my card. I'd sure like to hear from you. Uh, when, 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 when the rest of the story happens. That was Tuesday night. We didn't hear anything at all on, on Wednesday. Wednesday. No, in fact, you know, I, I brought it to our Wednesday morning prayer group, and we prayed for the doctor, we prayed for his phone, we prayed for who had it. And then Wednesday evening at our see me at Hop, uh, see me Hop, we, uh, we prayed again. I, I, I told the church, I said, hey, you, you need to know the rest of the story. We'd really like to pray for this doctor. And 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 see uh, have God uh, divinely intervene. And, and before it, we were before we got to prayer, what happened, Pastor Jan? Well, Jester raised his hand and he says, um, "I think I, I might have the answer to your story." And we said, "What?" And so you know? Jester then begins to tell. He says, "Well, he says last night, late last night, he said." Um, it was, I don't know, probably around midnight or whatever. He says, there was, a, there was a knock at my door. And he says, I was already in bed. He says, I went and I, I, I opened the door. And he says, here were some police officers from Moorpark. Four of them. And he says, these police officers started to question me about a, a, a phone, a, 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 an iPhone. Well, they first asked him if he owned a certain car. Yes. And then... Eventually, it came out. He told him the story about the phone, and it was an incredibly amazing story. Jester and Mark, on Tuesday, late Tuesday afternoon, they were over in Westlake Village. They had just left the Pacific Union Conference Office in Westlake Village, and they were over in that area of Townsgate and uh, Westlake Boulevard, and as they were driving, Jester sees this what appeared to be a black wallet laying in the middle of the of the of the road there and so they went back around he said mark did you see that they went back around and 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 mark jumps out and he goes and picks it up and they discover that it's an iphone but the but the screen is completely shattered on the phone so they have no way to determine the identity of this and uh jester uh, had some appointments that he had to go to, and he was trying to figure out what he was going to do. And then Jester came here to the church that evening because he uh, was attending the meeting that we had in my office that evening. And so that's why it was traced here to our campus. But he had already left to head home to Moor Park by the time the doctor got here. But the doctor eventually got his phone. Now, here's the interesting thing. We got home after see me hop on Wednesday night, and I get a call at probably it was close to 10 o'clock. I get a call from the doctor. And he says, Pastor, he says, I got to tell you the rest of the story. And I says, well, I think I know some of it. And I told him what I had found out that evening. I says, we went to go and pray for you at our, at our uh, midweek prayer uh, gathering. And I said, I, I learned the rest of the story. I said, one of my deacons told me he was the one that found your phone. And I says, I want to give you the assurance. I says, if you have any reason to believe that this man may have taken your phone, please rest assured. He's a man of integrity. He did not steal your phone. And he said, Pastor, I don't question that. But as he began to share the story from his perspective, he says, I began to trace things in my mind, and here's something that I don't understand. He said, I had my phone. He says, I was on my way home from Los Robles, uh, on, on my way from Los Robles Hospital to my home, in Westlake Village. He says, I had been talking to my wife on the phone. We had been talking about what we were going to do for dinner, etc. And he said, that was the last conversation and the last thing I remember with my phone. Now he says, here's what I don't know. He says, how did my phone end up in the middle of the street there in Westlake? How did it end up in the middle of the street? He says, I didn't have my window open and I didn't open my car door. How did it end up in the middle of the street? He says, I don't know. And then the doctor said, there are a lot of unanswered questions for me here. 
But he says, you know, I deeply appreciate the fact that the two of you prayed. I had had it on speakerphone, and he was talking with both of us. He talked about how much he appreciated our prayers, and he talked about how he has been personally challenged to make prayer. He says, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm trying to find ways to make prayer more active in my life and in my service and career as a physician. And so he and I were talking about that, and we were dialoguing about it. And, and I said, well, you know what? I think maybe I have some ideas. And he says, well, Pastor, he says, I'd love to get together with you. He says, maybe we can get together. And I says, yes. I said, I've got a book I want to give you that I think will, will help you. And I shared with him some of it, and he says, I'd love to have that book. And I says, well, let's get together. And so this next week, I plan to get together with the doctor. But here's something that he said that I found interesting. He says, I don't know how my phone ended up in the middle of the street. I don't know that. And he says, there's a lot of things I don't know about this story. And I'm trying to figure out why. But he says, maybe. He says, maybe it was for nothing more than God wanted me to meet and make some new friends. And I've thought about that, friends. I don't know where the rest of the story goes. I don't. I don't know how this story is going to end. I don't. But it was interesting. There were some of you who were at See Me Hop on Wednesday evening that told Pastor Jan and I, this isn't the end of the story. I don't think it is either. How it's going to end, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, God has mysterious ways. He has a boatload of people out there that he wants to reach with the complete truth about his character and his reputation. There are people out there who are believers that don't know the complete truth about Jesus. And God is wanting us to be his servants to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world who so desperately needs to hear it. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Here's the question, friends. Today God is looking. God is looking for modern-day Elishas who will be truth-tellers for Him. God is looking for people who will be bold to tell the complete truth about Jesus. As Jesus has touched your life, as Jesus has made a difference in your life, as you have been impacted with the gospel of Jesus and his healing touch in your life, are you willing to be one of his truth tellers to the world? Listen as we sing this song and think about how you are going to take the touch that Jesus has had in your life to be a touch for someone else. I've met this. 
his blessed Savior. Since he's cleansed and made me whole, I will ever cease to praise him. I'll shout. Father, we thank you so much for your divine touch in our lives. But may we never keep that to ourselves. Just as you have touched us, may we be the touch of healing and hope to a world around us. Bless us now as we leave this place of worship. And may the spirit and the joy of Jesus be in our hearts through this week to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.